All right, now I want to talk about the graphs of inverse functions. And I want to talk about a very particular relationship here. If we know that f of x equals y, then we also know that the inverse evaluated at y equals x. This is how inverse functions work. So if we look at the graph of our function f, it's going to include the point x comma y because when x is an input, we know that it outputs y. But what happens if we look at the graph of f inverse? Well, in this case, we know that y is the input and x is the output. So if we want to compare the graphs of f and f inverse, any point on the graph of f will have a corresponding point but with the coordinates switched when we look at the graph of the inverse function. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at what this means for us graphically. Let's suppose we have some function and that function is f of x. And let's suppose that the graph of this function had the point 0 comma 2, 1 comma 3, and 2 comma 6 on the graph. Let's suppose it contained these points, 0, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 6. Now, if we wanted to look at the inverse function and its graph, y equals f inverse of x, we know that for every point on the graph of f, there's a corresponding point on the graph of the inverse function, but where the coordinates are swapped. So the inverse is going to contain 2 comma 0, 3 comma 1, and 6 comma 2. Let's plot those points and see if we can find a relationship between these graphs. We've got 2 comma 0, We've got 3 comma 1 and 6 comma 2. Is there any relationship between these sets of points? Is there any sort of symmetry? There is a specific type of symmetry, but it's not a type of symmetry that we've seen before. In particular, the symmetry that we have here is symmetry about the line y equals x, which is a line that goes through the origin and it makes a 45 degree angle with the axes. So if we look, we've got a mirror image on these two sides. These three points on one side are mirrored on the other. So we have symmetry about the line y equals x. And so each of these graphs, each of these functions, actually come from a real function. These points, I didn't just pick them at random. Um, I was thinking specifically that f of x could be the function x squared plus 2. But to make it a one-to-one -one function, I'm going to look only at the values where x is greater than or equal to zero. So I picked these points because they were on the same graph of f of x equals x squared plus 2. And if we go through the process of finding the inverse function of f, so we let y be x squared plus 2, we replace x and y, so x equals y squared plus 2, and then we solve for y. We subtract 2 from both sides, x minus 2 equals y squared. To get y alone, we have to take the square root, but the thing is there's two square roots of x minus 2. 
the principal square root, which is usually positive, or the negative square root, but because we wanted x to be greater than or equal to zero in the original function, this meant that its domain was x greater than or equal to zero. Here in the inverse function, that means that the range has to be greater than or equal to zero, and that means we're taking the positive square root. So our inverse function, f inverse of x, is going to be the square root of x minus 2. And we know that that is the square root function shifted to the right two units, which matches these points exactly. So we can even see how the symmetry with the graphs matches what we've learned about finding inverse functions. We can do this algebraically, or if we have the graph of a function, we can find the graph of its inverse function geometrically. And I want you to be able to see the connection and recognize that we have the power to find inverse functions both algebraically and geometrically. If you ever have the graph of a function and you want to find its inverse, you can just take the graph and you can reflect it either point by point or the whole graph across the line y equals x, and that gives you the graph of the inverse function.